Hi. It's Thursday, the 6th of August, and I'm continuing to read from the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, Luke's sequel to his gospel, in which the early church finds its footing, figures out who it is, and begins to grow uh, all of this after Jesus has ascended, so isn't around to tell them what to do. And I'm hoping that you wonder uh, about it. Um, wonder what it means to you in 2020. Wonder what it means to us in 2020 uh, as a community. Um, I really wasn't happy with my uh, with my wondering yesterday. My reading was fine, but uh, it was a, it was a peculiar story, and it it, it, it bugged me. I, I I thought about it all night. Uh, woke up this morning still thinking about it. So I think that's actually a good thing. Uh, I'm, I'm engaging with the story and I still can't find a way that I'm getting what I what I need out of it. So I haven't resolved anything. I'm just still wondering about it. Um, where, where Peter seems to be following the path of Jesus, uh, or at least Herod's putting him that way. Arresting him, um, planning to put him before the crowd. Um, it, 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 very much like Jesus. And yet, of course... Uh, that's not what happens. Um, an angel comes and, and, and helps him escape uh, from prison. So I don't know what that what that means. Um, why wouldn't that have happened then for Jesus? Um, but maybe that's because, in fact, the the crucifixion is important to our faith. Um, that we need to know that that was, uh, whether whether you want to call it part of God's plan or, or whatever, um, the thing is that what happened with Jesus is an essential part of our faith. It needed to be there. We need Jesus to suffer and be humiliated. We need Jesus to die on the cross, not just for the resurrection, but also, I think, for us to understand God's presence in the worst of times. My faith has often made me believe um, that if I really believe, if I pray hard um, and God is um, on my side, then what happened to Peter will happen to me, right? If things go bad, an angel will come and lead me away from all the badness. You know, that theology works really well. Um, if you're uh, a middle-class white kid growing up in southern Ontario, like I was. Um, what, what does that theology have to say to you if you are living uh, in poverty, if you are living uh, in oppression, if you're living in a war zone? Why, why isn't an angel leading me away from this? And I don't yet, in engaging the story, have, a, have an answer for that, other than to say that being led away from disaster um, is not a sign of God's love or um, being left in hard times is not a sign of God's um, uh, disappearance. God is abundantly with Jesus. I mean, we believe in Trinitarians, Jesus and God are one, and so God is present on the cross. Um, so God is present there. God is also present in the escape of Peter. Um, perhaps those things have nothing to do with God's favor. Which is kind of what I was thinking last night. I'm still thinking it this morning. Anyway, that's not where we are today. Today we're moving on, and it's a short passage today, which is a good thing, given all the rambling I'm still doing. Um, I want to read chapter 12, just verses 20 to 25, uh, and... Um, and do a little bit of wondering. So here we go. Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. So they came to him in a body, and after winning over Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for a reconciliation, because their country depended on the king's country for food. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat on the platform, and delivered a public address to them. And the people kept shouting, The voice of God, not of a mortal! And immediately, because he had not given the glory to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of God continued to advance and gain adherence. And then, after completing their mission, Barnabas and Saul returned to Jerusalem and brought with them John, whose other name was Mark. There you go. 
the death of Herod. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, so I don't know where to start with this one. Um, one, uh, so Luke, the author of this passage, he seems to understand um, the inner workings of God's mind. Um, because Herod, um, immediately, because he was not, because he had not given the glory to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. So it seems pretty clear, Luke seems to know for sure, that because Herod had not given glory to God, he was struck down. I, I have to wonder about that a little bit. Um, I'm pretty sure there were other times that Herod spoke and did not give the glory to God. Uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, most of his public addresses did not involve giving the glory to the God of Abraham. Um, that's a, so, so here uh, Luke is giving us a story um, for a reason. He has constructed this for a reason his way. Right, so he seems to know God's motives here. Uh, he has interpreted events, and good on him. We're also able to to um, question that and and push back at it. Um, but I don't know where to push on this. There aren't enough details, uh, except to say it's very odd to me that Luke seems to understand uh, why God is doing things, because uh, a lot of what God does, well. A lot of things that God does are mis are mysterious. Um, this one seems pretty clear to Luke, um, and uh, and and I and I do I love the, and it's an idiom. Uh, he was eaten by worms and died. Um, <laughs> I just think that's a lovely uh, expression. But notice that it's eaten by worms and died. Doesn't say he died and was eaten by worms. I don't know if that's important. Um, uh, what do we mean by died? And does that mean um, is excluded from from eternal life? I, I personally don't don't believe that. I think that all of us have have, have eternity within. Um, but it's an interesting idiom. Um, he was eaten by worms and died. Maybe it's just the thing of translation, but I find that kind of intriguing. Eaten by worms, that's what naturally happens to our bodies. What has happened to Herod's soul? Does Luke want us to to believe that Herod, uh, his body has has, has has gone back into the earth and also that his soul has been extinguished? Uh, is Luke that angry at Herod? Again, how could Luke possibly know this? Um, uh, or is this just an idiom that, as it's translated into English, uh, we wonder about? Um, but it is worth wondering. Those people in our lives um, that we either know through media or sometimes know personally, those people that we truly despise, can we imagine them living on in eternity? That Can we believe that life beyond this life is also for them. <sighs> uh, I can't remember which short story it is. Um, it's one of C.S. Lewis's short stories in one of his collections. Gosh, that's a good footnote. Thanks, Norm. Anyway, I, I remember the image um, <clears throat> of a man uh, waiting to get on the bus, and the bus goes to heaven. So he has died. He waits at the bus stop. The bus comes along. All he has to do is get on the bus, and the bus will take him to heaven. But when the bus opens, he looks in and the driver is the very man who killed his wife in life. And therefore he refuses to get on the bus. And every day the bus comes and the same driver and the man refuses to get on the bus. And C.S. Lewis lets that image sit with you. If Herod was driving the bus, would you get on it? If you knew that the people you despise, that people have hurt you, okay, it's not just you took a dislike to them, they hurt you unjustly, whatever that may be, and I don't want to trigger anybody by trying to think of things, but, you know, what if that person was also in heaven, as it were, or was also, let's just say, loved by God? How do you manage that? wonder. 
I don't think that that's what Luke is trying to do here, but I think it's something that's worth wondering about sometime. What is our capacity for forgiveness? When do we um, forgive and when do we, for our own personal integrity, say, no, I can't do this yet? Can we ever say, I would like to forgive this person, but I'm just not capable. Therefore, I am glad that God can forgive them because I'm still hurting. Is that a thing? I don't know. And I know I've gone way off track here. But I think these are things that are worth wondering about sometimes. But getting back into the text just ever so quickly, um, <clears throat> Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. And to show off my 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 years of Greek, um, Herod was angry. It's a pretty decent translation. I, I think Herod was hostile toward. So it wasn't just he was fuming quietly. He was um, actively uh, wishing to do something to harm them. So he was hostile uh, would be a, a, the better translation of the Greek. But 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 angry is, is gets it too. He, he there's tension between Herod and Tyre and Sidon. We don't know why. Historically, we have no idea why. Uh, we know that Tyre and Sidon and a whole lot of other places required, um, were dependent on on uh, on the empire, uh, on Herod for food. So food would be meted out and, and shared out, and um, something has happened in their relationship. And I assume that Tyre and Sidon are afraid that Herod's going to cut off the food supply, right? It actually says that. Um, that they they asked for reconciliation because their country depended on the king's country for food, um, so they came to his, they came to Herod in a body, and it says after winning over Blastus, the king's chamberlain, so his his advisor, they asked for reconciliation. Um, after winning over Blastus, uh, by force of argument, maybe could also be by bribe. Um, the term can be used either way. Uh, so what, however it is, they've turned Blastus to their side, either because they've convinced Blastus that they are worthy of support or they uh, have bribed him. Doesn't matter. They have turned the politicians their direction. Okay. So, um, uh, the, the diplomats, as it were, um, the, the leaders of Tyre and Sidon, have made a deal with Blastus and they've sought reconciliation through him with Herod so they can keep getting food because they don't want their people to starve. That sounds pretty much like politics the way you and I know politics. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took a seat on the platform and delivered a public address to them. And the people kept shouting the voice of a god and not of a mortal. They insult Herod. They are angry at Herod. They are accusing Herod of not being as good as they are because Herod doesn't understand about God. Herod doesn't um, acknowledge God. He is not faithful. Uh, that's what the people are doing. This is a really bad way <laughs> of maintaining the peace. <laughs> so why is Luke telling us this story? Um, well, on one hand, we get to zap Herod. And so we get to we get to finally kill off the bad guy, and we feel good about that, um, and we can show that the people wanted him killed off. Got it. But why set up the political stuff beforehand then? If if, if Luke is creating this, um, so there is tension. The leaders negotiate a peace, as it were, that should benefit everybody. But the people aren't satisfied. The people are still upset. The people are literally protesting in the square. They are confronting politicians. They are confronting the king and they are shouting at him. Does that sound familiar in 2020? Sure does sound familiar to me. So I wonder then in this story, with whom does God side? The high-level politicians who have worked out, um, perhaps corrupt, but, but, but a peace that is going to allow the people to have their food. Does God side with them? Or does God side with the crowd? Now, much like before, I, I'm not saying that, 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 that God loved Peter more than John when he allowed John to be killed, um, uh, but, not, but not Peter. Um, 
I think, you know, God is with us either side of this. But if you're looking to hear the voice of God, if you're looking to recognize the will of God, in this story, I wonder, should you look to the leaders, the negotiators, or should you look to the crowd? This story, to me, suggests that we should be looking to the crowd because they they called Herod out, and apparently then an angel of the Lord struck him down, Herod, and he was eaten by worms and died. I think, I think that Luke wants us to know that God is with the crowd. God is with the people. Um, not that God ignores the leaders, but primarily if we're looking to see God's presence, if we're looking to share God's love, if we're looking to see God in action, the crowd is going to reveal God more readily than the leaders. As we're told all through this, uh, just before this passage and after, that the church continued to grow. Right? Uh, the word of God continued to advance and gain adherence, we hear in verse 24. Um, why is that? Perhaps because we recognize God not in leadership, but in the crowd. Not in those invested in maintaining the status quo, peace, order, good government, but in fact, in the voice of the crowd who were crying out for change. I don't know. It's something I wonder about. And and I'm not trying to uh, uh, to suggest that you need to, to side with every protest or every um, voice raised um, uh, in, in media these days. But I am saying that we need to listen to the people, whoever the people are, uh, and maybe not just uh, assume that the leaders, the ministers, and the kings uh, have the answers. But uh, I don't know. That's just where I am for the moment. But with that in mind, let me offer a prayer. Loving God, thank you. Thank you for your voice. And may we open our ears to hear it in the crowds, in the people who are often overlooked. May we hear it in whispers and in shouts. We don't have to distrust our leaders to open our hearts to those who disagree. So God, help us be open to all the ways that your will, that your love, that your justice is expressed in our lives and in the community. And God, every now and again, remind us of your capacity to forgive and invite us to wonder about our own. We pray in Jesus' name, through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, friends, that's me for today, but I will check in with you tomorrow. Until then, please be good to yourself. Be, be blessed and be a blessing because there are people who need the love you can share. And know you're not alone. See you tomorrow.